good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He has a plan. He has a plan for us. He has a plan for this church. And it's a good plan, okay? And here's what his plan involves. That we would find salvation for our souls through faith in Jesus Christ and choose to follow him, okay? That we would be restored to right relationship with God and that we would uh, know him and grow in, grow in him. And as we do that, God calls us to be part of his church, okay? And part of that called out assembly, God's plan for his church is simple, simple that we would help others to find Christ and the new life that he gives, that we would be part of someone else's journey to God through faith in Christ. And here's how the Bible puts it. Jesus said this in, in the New Testament book of Matthew. He said this, um, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I am surely with you to the end of the age. And another, I like um, how it says here in the New Testament book of Jude, be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire, and save them. Okay? That is the basic, simple call of this group of people that Jesus called church. Okay? Not a church building, but people. You know, God has given his church an assignment, and we have one life and one chance to make it happen. And I love the story of this guy. You know, maybe something uh, like this has happened to you. I don't know. But um, I'm glad it didn't happen to me. Uh, but anyway, at the end of his college semester, he had one more big paper to finish in order to graduate. And after several sleepless nights and, and a lot of trip to the, to the campus library, he finally finished his paper and turned it in. He was excited. Three days later, every student, you know, got their paper back, uh, graded and everything, and he found words from his professor written in red. Good research, great illustrations, wonderful bibliography, grade F, wrong assignment. Oh. Yeah, oh, you know, and, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I hope that that won't be what happens to me someday, where I stand before God, and on that final day hear him say, nice house, Mike. Great job, sweet ride, wonderful salary, or whatever. Uh, you know, <laughs> grade F, wrong assignment. I would hate to hear something like that on that day. You know, God isn't going to ask me, how much money did you make, Mike? How popular were you? How much were you able to finally bench press before you died? You know, um, did you root for the right football team, which we all know is the 49ers? Um, you know? <laughs> Uh, he's not going to ask those questions, though that last one might, you know. But, but he's going to ask me, how many people did you bring with you, Mike? That's what he's going to ask me. You know, how many people did you snatch from the fire? God has a plan for his people, who he calls the church. And that plan directly involves reaching people with the amazing message of God's love and forgiveness and, and restoration uh, and the life that's found in Christ. And within that general call, each local church, you know, has something more specific. And, and you know, the, like with the journey, um, our church, the journey exists to create and be a safe and embracing place where people can see God, encounter Christ, and be changed by him. That's what we want to do as this local church. Um, specifically, we're a church for the spiritually curious, a church for those who are unchurched but are curious about spiritual things, designed to reach younger people, you know, to be embracing, non-judging, people who hunger for what's real. And some of you, you know, uh, might be stuck on the previous question, and maybe you're a little worried about your answer. Well, how many people am I bringing with me, you know, to heaven on that day? Uh, some, some of you might be a little worried about that. Um, you know, thinking, oh man, does God want me to stand on the street corner and preach? Because I can't do that, you know? Um, no, this is why God wants to place us in local churches because he wants us to team together to accomplish the assignment that he has for our lives. You following in that? Teaming together because we all have different gifts and talents and so forth. Um, so let's look at um, team church here. First of all, uh, 
Isn't that beautiful? We just want to see some W's with that, you know. Anyway, so um, next point here is, is church as a team is God's design, okay? It is God's design. Uh, it always has been. We were never called to be a church to do, you know, or do our assignment alone because it's impossible. I'm going to read a story. Um, there's a book. There's a pastor in Hawaii named Wayne Cordero, and uh, uh, kind of a cool story here. So um, here we go. He said, one of the more popular sports on the islands is canoe paddling. In this sport, six paddlers make up the engine room for an outrigger canoe of the type that traversed the islands more than 200 years ago. Although navigating one of these ancient canoes may look like child's play, the actual technique requires much more than meets the eye. One summer, uh, six of us from the church received an invitation to compete as a crew in an upcoming canoe race. We were game for something new, so we accepted the invitation and immediately sought out a canoe instructor from a nearby club. We started our first lesson in a lake of brackish water. Our instructor sat astride the nose of the canoe, facing us as he called out signals and instructions. Once we took our places, the first uh, lesson began. Okay, everyone, he yelled, this is how you hold a paddle. Then he modeled the correct form, and we figured out which end we were supposed to grasp and with which hand, and so he continued to instruct us. We're going to paddle our first stretch of water. It will be an eighth of a mile sprint. When I began the stopwatch and say go, just paddle as fast and as hard as you can. When we cross the finish line, I'll notify you. Then uh, that's when you can stop paddling. Got it? How hard can this be, I thought. Every ch- you know, even children can paddle canoes. This ought to be a breeze. Just then, the sharp call of our coach shattered my self-confident thoughts. Ho'oma koa koa imua. I think I got it right. I wasn't speaking in tongues, by the way. Uh, that's what he says. So in English, that means ready, go forward. With our muscles bulging and sinews stretched, we burst out um, of our dead in the water uh, starting position like a drowning elephant trying to get air. We thrash the water with our paddles on either side of the canoe, not knowing when to switch from one side to the other. We all figured it made sense to switch when one arm got, t- got tired. So firing at will, I crossed the blade of my oar over and across the canoe, and when I did, I scraped the back of my fellow paddler seated directly in front of me. He grunted as the oar uh, etched a red mark across his spine, but neither of us stopped. We just kept wildly flailing our arms like amateur ice skaters trying to regain their balance. We were on a crusade. Uh, yet soon it felt like hours had, had elapsed. My arms began to feel heavy as lead, and my lungs felt on fire. My teammate's back had started to bleed, and water had filled our canoe halfway to the top. The elephant was beginning to drown, and we, when we finally heard our coach say, Okay, stop! Thank God, I thought. We abandoned the sinking, sinking canoe and let our bodies slump into the water, totally exhausted. One minute, 42 seconds, our coach called out, called out pretty sad. Like war-torn warriors, we comforted each other, apologizing for the scrapes and wounds inflicted by our flailing paddles. We uh, started bailing water out of the lumbering canoe, which by now looked more like a listing submarine than a sleeking racing ves- sleek racing vessel. Coach gathered us, whimpering novices together, and after a few basic, basics about safety, taught us how to paddle as a team. Each fledgling paddle, paddler was to mirror the man in front of him, and everyone was to move in time with the lead stroker. Coach taught us how to switch our paddles to the opposite hand without injuring each other. We practiced together again and again until our stroking became as rhythmic as our metronome. We were beginning to look good. After a few practice runs, Coach took us back to our original starting position. All right, he said. Let's try that same eighth-mile stretch again, only this time. I want you to stroke as if you're taking a leisurely stroll through the park. No sprinting. Just mirror the one in front of you and switch with a smooth cadence of... Rhythm, just as you were taught, stroke as a team. And with new confidence, we took our mark. The coach barked out the signal, Ho'oma kao kao imua. I'm not sure if that's what it said the first time. But anyway, uh, our oars silently entered the water, coordinated in perfect time. Our canoe cut through the water like a knife through jelly. We switched sides uh, without skipping a beat. We each mirrored the rower in front of us. Somehow, in just a few minutes, we had been transformed from a drowning circus animal into a precision machine. Then, just as we began to feel the exhilaration of our smooth progress, our jubilant coach yelled, okay, stop paddling. This ahead of expected arrival caught all of us by surprise. Anybody tired? We all shook our heads. No. 
Coach held up his stopwatch so that we could see the truth. Then he exclaimed, you beat your last time by 24 seconds. We couldn't believe it. Nobody injured? Nobody overboard? No one exhausted enough to keel over? Uh, No canoe deluged with water? No fire in my lungs? In sheer delight, we congratulated each other, gave a few victory shouts, exchanged lays, and took pictures. This was amazing. And we did it together. We had paddled as a team. You know, cool story. It's amazing what teams can do when they work together and they learn to work together um, and they find their stride, whether it's rowing teams or football teams, um, you know, or churches. Uh, you know, I remember this talk about teams. I love team games and, and sports and so forth. That um, a summer camp that we took uh, some of our youth to this, this summer, one of the ga- they had all these team building type games and contests. And so one of the, the games that is they had these two trees that were probably about you know, 10 feet apart from each other. And they strung all this rope in between them like a spider web. And so the, the teams had to figure out how to get... So they were like holes, you know, in the ropes. Can you <laughs> understand what I'm doing here? So <laughs> holes in the ropes. And, uh, and so you had to get your teammates through the holes. And once you use a hole, you couldn't use it again. And they couldn't touch the rope going through either. Okay, And so they had to figure out, okay, who's going through which hole? How are we going to get them across? And so forth. So anyway, so finally they got everyone through except for one guy. And one guy is, is looking. And the, the last hole, he's the last person. But the bottom was taken. They already did the top. And it was just like one that was about four feet off the ground in the middle that he had to somehow get through without touching the rope. And he's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to do a Superman. And so he, he, he stands way back over here, okay? And he, he goes for it and he tells his team, catch me, you know, because I'm going to be flying through. You know, so they are, they're all on the other side, you know, with their arms ready to go. And he runs back and he runs. And sure enough, I could not believe it. I wish I had a video camera. He does this Superman. I mean, literally flat as a board, right through, didn't touch. Everyone's standing here and they just watched him go by <laughs> as... Uh, as he uh, did a belly flop into the dirt. So, you know, uh, sometimes, it was awesome, actually. Uh, so sometimes teams don't work the best, but they learn, you know, t- together. But anyway, so, but teams are, team, the team that the Bible describes, uh, the church, you know, um, is even more connected and more able to work better even than a sports team. It's described in the Bible as a body with all the parts working together. And here's um, a passage, a couple passages in the Bible. It says this, just as each of us, and speaking of the church, ecclesia, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Okay? Another, another um, part in 1 Corinthians says this, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And it is an illustration that, that is just packed with not just team, but closely related team members. Does that make sense? Okay, closely related. Uh, you know, when I lived in Oregon and, and pastored a church there, I used to play basketball every Tuesday and Thursday morning at 6 a.m. Uh, I loved it, and I miss it, actually. You know, I haven't been able to find anything uh, around the, our house or around here that uh, fits my schedule, and that's free. Uh, but anyway, uh, but I, I've, I've played a few times um, since we've moved here, uh, a few basketball games I've played, and uh, though I, I can't play as well as I did 20 years ago, I'm, I'm actually still amazed at what my body still can do, okay? Don't worry, I don't, still, I don't stand there saying, oh, I just amazed myself. No, I'm just amazed by what the, the, the body still can do, okay? But at, I mean, at, at the mere decision of my mind, for example, I can have my feet move down the court while I'm dribbling the basketball and keeping it away from the other team, uh, you know, looking for an open pass or a shot. I can still jump for rebounds, you know, and hit a turnaround jump shot, uh, you know, and it's cool. Everything still works quite a bit slower and more painfully, but it still works, okay? Um, I just have to carry Advil with me for, for afterwards. But, you know, how does this all happen? 
How can, how can I just do all that still, you know? I, I, I probably do it, it feels faster than it actually is, but, but how can I still, you know, do all that? Because all the parts of my body are present, for one, okay? A little hard, hard to tell my hand to shoot the ball if my arm isn't connected to the, you know, shoulder to my hand, okay? Um, I'm not missing any body parts, for one, so, so thank God about, for that, okay? The parts of my body are working together like a team, Every muscle, tendon, ligament, bone, nerve, and it's really cool what each of us can accomplish when things are intact, okay? And, and I'm sure you're tracking what I'm saying, whatever y- you can do as well, even just walking and chewing gum. Some people can't do that, but anyway. Um, but, you know, that's the picture that the Bible gives of how the church is called a function, like a team, like a body, with parts closely connected and all working together, all working to accomplish the assignment that God has given us to do together. Next, the team, teams need unity. Okay? And, I, and I think uh, we've all heard this phrase, united we stand, divided we fall, right? Most of us heard that. You guys still hear? Or should we put that other slide back up with the sleepy guy? Um, uh, but it's true of any team, any government, any uh, country, any army, family, or church. Okay, disunity is destructive, but unity is powerful. In fact, our own nation, the United States of America, okay, could not have been started apart from the united efforts of 13 very different col- British colonies. Each colony had its own history and purpose. Each one was ruled by England. Okay? There, were, there was no united colonial army in existence. And here's what happened. Okay, Benjamin Franklin, he said this, Trying to get all 13 colonies to agree would be like trying to get 13 different clocks to strike the same hour at precisely the same time. And this is what Ben Franklin said. And history records that the delegates of the 13 colonies went on to approve the Declaration of Independence. Um, After the announcement of the vote, silence moved over the Congress as the men contemplated the magnitude of what they had just done. Some wept openly while others bowed in prayer. After signing the declaration with unusually large handwriting, the president of the Continental Congress, John Hancock, broke the silence and declared, His Majesty can now read my name without glasses, and he uh, he can also double the price on my head, is what he said. Then he went on to say at this tense moment, we must be unanimous. There must be no pooling in different ways. We must all hang together. And Benjamin Franklin responded in his characteristic wit, yes, we must all indeed hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately, is what he said, you know. And uh, though he was being a smart aleck, um, everyone knew how serious he was. They had to be in it together as one. And look what they accomplished through that. Now we'll show the other clip from uh, Remember the Titans. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. (laughs) Wake up, gentlemen, it's late, it's 3 a.m. in the morning. All right, listen up. You will follow Doc, myself, and the other coaches. We're going to take a little run through the woods. If you get lost along the way, don't bother coming back to camp. Just hitchhike your hind parts on home. Any questions? Coach, it's a high school football team. We're not the Marines here. Let's go. Let's go. Anybody know what this place is? This is Gettysburg. 
This is where they fought the Battle of Gettysburg. 50,000 men died right here on this field, fighting the same fight that we're still fighting amongst ourselves today. This green field right here, painted red, bubbling with the blood of young boys, smoke and hot lead pouring right through their bodies. Listen to their souls, man. They killed my brother with malice in my heart. Hatred destroyed my family. You listen. You take a lesson from the dead. If we don't come together right now on this hollow ground, we too will be destroyed. Just like they were. I don't care if you like each other or not, but you will respect each other. And maybe. I don't know, maybe we'll learn to play this game like men. It's a powerful scene. Um, I love that clip. And it's, it's a message, I think, for every team, um, for every church. I've seen basketball teams, I've actually seen this, completely fall apart because players on their own team are fighting each other. And we're arguing with each other and we're coming, you know, you, you, you know, and, and, and just getting all frustrated with each other. And I've seen churches fall apart for the same reason. In fact, you know, uh, remember how Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church? Um, it's true. There's nothing that Satan can do directly to defeat the church. But we as people can hinder it or even stop it. When we aren't aware and we give in to the lies of our enemy and we live for ourselves rather living for unity. The church has to love each other. We are called to love and respect each other, to be and to move forward together as a team, as a body. You know, and this is one reason why intersection groups are so important, why gathering together um, on on Sundays is important, because we have to be, you know, um, be together in order to team together. Right? Um, you know, they say that a dying man's wishes reveal what's most important to him. And the Bible reveals a lot about what was on Jesus' heart on the night before he went to the cross. Um, and here's one of those things. Here's what he said. This is found in, in John chapter 17. He was praying. This is what was recorded that came out of his mouth. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I, and he's talking about those who would follow him. I pray for also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you, have, that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved you know, and as we saw last week, you know, finishing the book of Philippians, God invites us to pray and ask him for things. And God is faithful to answer our prayers. He has answered many of my prayers, uh, too many to count, me personally. And I, I would bet the same thing with you, that he has answered so many. I mean, there are probably thousands of prayers uh, answered just in this room alone. And um, wouldn't it be cool if when we get to heaven one day, Jesus comes to us, and he says to us, hey, thanks for being an answer to my prayer. Thanks for getting along, for being one, for being in unity, you know. So we know that church, what church is and why it is, and we know that God has an assignment for people in this church, and that living church as a team, is God's best way for us to finish the assignment he's given us. So how do we do it? This last point here, and we'll continue as we go on with the series. Reaching for the best means everyone participates. Nobody is irrelevant. Everybody is a part, uh, is a part and has a significant role to play. Just like a body, 
needs a hand, a foot, an eye, a nervous system, a digestive system in order to function properly. Just like a football team needs a center and a defensive end, just as much as it needs a quarterback and a wide receiver, there isn't one part that is, oh, we don't need that part. Every part is significant. You know, uh, back um, a couple weeks ago, we were at fair. Uh, I think my only two hours at fair uh, this time around. And um, Caitlin and, and, and uh, the others were showing their, their bunnies and they're doing, you know, um, or the, the cavies, I think. They were doing showmanship and all that. Well, anyway, I had to leave, and so I was going to say bye to Caitlin. And, and so I walk up behind her, you know, and she's sitting there and her friends. Anyway, so, so I'm walking up. So I walk up uh, to say bye to Caitlin. I go to put my hands on her shoulders. And I was gonna, about to give her a kiss on the forehead like I normally do. And up looks this girl that wasn't Caitlin. And I go... <laughs> I'm so sorry, you know, and I walk over, hi, Caitlin, you know, and because they were wearing the same shirt and everything, and I almost kissed somebody else's daughter, and, you know, and maybe possibly ended up in jail. I don't know, but, um, uh, but I am thankful that when she looked up, my eyes recognized that, you know, it wasn't Caitlin, and so I was in my hands, cooperated with my brain, let go, and, you know, because everything was working together, you know? Does that make sense? My eyes didn't decide to, like, you know, or do some, like, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, but team church means everyone participates, okay? Imagine if, you know, my eyes didn't just start at all. I just don't feel like participating right now, you know, or my hands or whatever, you know, and I mean, awkward. So, um, but... (laughs) Everyone participates, not just the, the body, not, not just because the body or the church needs you, but because you need the church too, okay? All of us need each other. Uh, in the New Testament book of Matthew, in chapter 22, I'm going to close with G- this. Jesus tells a story. I'm not going to read the story, but, but it, it's in the, the first part of Matthew 22. Uh, a story of what the kingdom of God is like. And that God is preparing a huge wedding feast, okay? Uh, and the feast is so big and so elaborate that it makes our food fest look like a bad day at McDonald's, okay? As good as they are. And that's, what, that's what it makes it look like, okay? It even makes in and out look questionable. But anyway, um, but, you know, this, this wedding feast is going to be awesome. It's going to be totally awesome. Uh, there will be celebrating. It's going to be full of life and love and belonging. And, there, you know, there's going to be nothing like it. Well, on that day, or one thing that's clear in that story is that God isn't the only one who makes this wedding feast happen. Yeah, he'd been planning it and eagerly waiting for it, okay? But he has a team that helps make it happen. Some are mentioned and some are not. Some, some of this huge team are sent out to invite the invited. Some are sent to invite the uninvited, who are now the invited, some greet those who come in. Some seat people. Some team are cooks. Some serve. Some decorate. Some clean. Some do the setup. Some do the, the some are parts of the band. Some administrate and write, write all the checks and pay all the bills. But God works with a team in this story to make it happen. Okay. And over the next few weeks, as we continue, well, I was gonna, before I say that, you and I are part of this team to invite people to the feast of the ages. We get to do that and team together. And that the journey is part of that team. And over the next few weeks as we continue uh, to talk about team church, I invite you, especially if you aren't yet, to join this team here at the journey, to understand why you're here, to find your place and participate, and to move from being a spectator to being a participant on the field. It will make a difference in your life, and you will make a difference in the lives of others. When God asks us one day, how many did you bring with you? we will be able to answer because